Hey everybody, welcome to uh, the new and improved kind of look of the indie show. I have, I'm so excited. Uh, this is Danny Fountain. Oh, we're already getting some people liking and hearting. Awesome. So, um, for those of you who who don't know what's happening, which is pretty much everybody except Kate Brockmeyer right now, who's also in the room with us, is that Danny and I are both in my apartment right now. Uh, we're both in Chicago, um, and she's in a separate room as me, so we can try and keep things down. Um, but you guys, I am so excited to have Danny with us. So Danny and I met through um, Jana Bishop. I don't know if Jana's watching yet, um, but she connected us up that we would be kind of fun to work together, and then... When Danny was in Chicago, she's nomading a lot right now. Um, we met up a what was supposed to be kind of like a half hour long <laughs> coffee meeting turned into like almost like an entire day long, like us hanging out. And now I can't get enough of her. She's so, <laughs> so impressive. Um, if if she wants to share how old she is, um, she can do that if she wants. But she is super, super impressive for how much she's doing and how much she's accomplished in the short amount of time that she's been in the entrepreneur hustling space. So Danny, with that being said, I'm going to turn um, it over to you. If you kind of want to share your story, what you're up to. And then while you're doing that, I'm going to share what's happening here. Heck yeah. So first of all, it's so good to be here. Um, for those of you that don't know, Joey and I, like he said, met a couple months ago and have become fast best friends. <laughs> Um, he's been one of the gracious hosts on this nomad adventure, letting me sleep in his living room. Um, and then we also co-worked together at Shar's space over at City Girl when I'm in town. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, so I got started almost nine years ago now, Joey. Next month, it's nine years. Um, so crazy. I was 14 years old. I was dating the child of a state representative in Michigan. And the state representative said, hey, Danny, do you want to help me market and get the word out to young voters? And still being four years from voting age myself, I was like, yes, because at the time I wanted to go to college to be a lawyer. And then after that, I was going to go into politics. I had this whole plan, which is so funny now. Um, so I said, yes, I helped him out. And then at the end of that summer, I just kept freelancing on the side while I was a sophomore, junior and senior in high school, because he just kept sending people my way. And I went off to college and switched the business from marketing to resume and career consulting. <laughs> I created people's resumes. I helped them overhaul their LinkedIn's and did that all through undergrad while also working 50 hours a week overnight at McDonald's, which was a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I saw that, not to interrupt, but I saw that you, and you use your experience at McDonald's. Oh, and yeah. Lessons learned there in what you're doing now as well. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, so then after undergrad, I got a job at Whirlpool. I was hired November of my senior year of undergrad, which was crazy because then I just spent the rest of senior year, you know, enjoying life because I knew I had a job when I graduated. Uh, went away to work at Whirlpool and less than a month after graduating undergrad started my master's degree. Was still side hustling on the side, went back to the marketing thing, gave up on the resume and career thing because obviously that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, went back to helping people with their marketing, was working on my master's and was working at Whirlpool full time. Moved to Chicago for love. The love didn't work out, but the entrepreneurship sure as hell did. Um, ended up getting laid off twice in 2016 uh, with three months in between. And finally listened to the universe and said, you know what? I'm going to do this full time. December of 2016 realized that I was going to be traveling so much this year for all of the speaking gigs that I didn't need an apartment. So I donated or sold 75% of my belongings, moved out of my apartment the day before my birthday, and I've been nomad ever since. That's so awesome. And so, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I want to unpack there, but <laughs> yeah. um, the, the fact that what you're, what you're doing in the nomad space now really was something that kind of just made strategic sense because you had lined up all these conferences. 
Oh, yeah. And don't get it wrong. Like, I am obsessed with travel. You know this. Even before December of last year, I'd been to over 20 countries. So it wasn't like this nomad year was something that I was doing by force. Um, Really married my passion for travel with just the need to not have an apartment. I love it. And is there an end date on the, the nomading right now? So when I first started, I said December of 2017. And I'd still like to hold true to December of 2017, but because, and we're going to talk about this, because of all the visibility I've gotten from all of the pitching that I've done, I now have speaking gigs booked through the end of 2018. So this might not end at the end of the year. We'll see. So let's, before we get to pitching, let's just recap all of the current hats that you're wearing. So you're, you're branding yourself as a digital nomad. Yes. And then you have leading roles and and then will you explain what else are you is on your plate yes so i'm a digital nomad um i'm an author this year my third and fourth book come out i'm an educator speaking at all of these conferences i own a business partnership with rosemary watson and jana bishop where we create content together and then i'm also the rising tide society creative council chair and a moderator and I serve on the board of advisors for another business, and I'm involved with the United Nations Empower Women Council. And did you mention your podcast? Oh no, I didn't. I co-host. <laughs> I co-host a podcast with Lola Gilbert called The Self Made Babe. It's awesome. And you guys just wrapped up your first season. Yes, yesterday. Man, so I mean, there's there's really like so much here, but let's let's start with the idea of a pitching to big brands, because I I know that that's something that you're passionate about that you speak about. Um, And do you think that that's something that is kind of a space where some creatives should be really really thinking about it? Or is this something that kind of across the board, everybody who's in the creative space should at least understand kind of what your message is? So when I think about pitching, I also have to be very honest with you. Uh, When I started on this Nomad Year, I didn't plan and becoming an influencer type of nomad. Um, What happened is I was aware of my surroundings. I was at a conference in January, seated two seats down from the executive vice president of sales for Caveman Foods, and we just started talking. He traveled 200,000 miles a year because he's a sales guy. He's on the road. I was going to be doing the same this year because I was a nomad. The more that we talked, the more that we realized we had so much in common, and the more that we realized the nomad space could be a secondary market for them because they were going after like the crossfitters and the paleo Mm -hmm. folks. And the partnership came out of that conversation. So I have to be honest with you, this whole pitching thing just came out of being aware of my surroundings. But um, to answer your question, any creative can do that. It's about when you're at a conference, paying attention. When you're at a coffee chat, listening to their pain points instead of seeking to fill a gap before you've made the connection, there's a lot to be gained from that. Cool. And then um, I want to make sure that I'm helping you promote this, the new thing that you're doing um, with Jana and uh, what's, what's your other partner's name again? Rosemary. Rosemary. Um, what's the name of that again? So um, it's called Styled Marketing LLC. We have two courses. Uh, the Styled Marketing Course, and the Seller Society. And then later this year, we are launching a new top secret project called Camp Launch. You are so freaking busy. So (laughs) you told me that you recently launched one of those, like, this week? Oh, so that's something that I just launched on my own because so many questions around pitching. Okay, and what's that called? Uh, It's called the Ultimate Pitching Resource. So I'm literally taking the entire workflow that I've templated from pitching to land the 64 speaking gigs that I have this year, the six brand partners, and then all the one-off integrations that I have, taken that workflow, bundled it up, um, and it's available to you guys so you can duplicate what I'm doing. Because we all have different niches, so it's not like you're going to be stealing what I'm doing. Well, I just dropped a link, kind of a note to myself. Um, to I know that you sent me that link. I'll drop that in the comments um, later because I think that's that, I think throughout the video people will understand why this is so valuable. But let's mm-hmm. unpack a little bit of, of kind of what's in your um, your messaging, like your talking points and your takeaways when you talk about. 
pitches? Um, yeah. So the formula that I use is one that anyone can use, really. Um, when I am looking for a brand to pitch, the first place I look is my backyard. What are the brands that I'm using? Hmm. So Beyond Caveman, the very first brand that I pitched this year was Kempton Hotels. And in that email to Kempton Hotels, I was able to say that I'd been a loyalty member of the Kempton mm-hmm. Hotels Karma program for five, six, seven years, uh, that I'd stayed at hotels coast to coast because I'd stayed at a hotel in New York and San Francisco, that I knew they had hotels opening in Europe. So I was able to leverage the relationship I already had by being a consumer of the brand um, to get that partnership. Same thing with T-Mobile. I T-Mobile may not have the best service, like Verizon <laughs> has the best service. <laughs> Um, but T-Mobile has hands down the best international cell phone right. on the market. Yeah. I have unlimited data and texting in something like 180 countries. That number's probably off. Um, 75 bucks a month. And I was a consumer of that plan yeah. because of so much traveling and just had a conversation, sent an email, said that I was brand loyal, shared how they were helping. Um, and it turned into a brand partnership. So the very first piece when you're thinking of pitching is look in your backyard. What are the products, services, platforms that you're using? And start there when you want to craft a pitch. So interesting. So I, I think that's a really good point because I think a lot of people, when they think about who can I reach out to, that idea of who who do I even start with can can be the thing that prevents you from taking any further steps. Oh, yeah. So I really like that idea of just kind of starting with the the businesses that you as a consumer are using because not only are they in your backyard but the fact that you're using them so closely and you kind of are the brain of your business means that there's probably some alignment there exactly Mm -hmm. um that's awesome and so so in terms of kind of reaching out to that um brand um or sending that like initial thing are you a fan of like short and sweet kind of just kind of starting to get your foot in the door for a conversation or a more long drawn out email or like, is it super so customized? You, you have to remember that the email that you're sending, um, it doesn't matter how much research you do on the internet, the address that you end up sending it to, that person is a gatekeeper. They're not a decision maker. Mm. So I'm a fan of making that initial email longer. I'll do LinkedIn research, find the person who's doing community partnerships for the brand And I'll write an email that's like, hey, A, this is why I absolutely love the brand. This is how I've been using the brand. This is why I'm brand loyal. B, this is something that I see that you need. So in the case of Kempton, every single one of the Kempton properties are tailored to the local area. And I said, as a digital nomad, wanting to learn more about each community I'm traveling to, Kempton was attractive to me because it wasn't just another corporate hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I told them what I'm doing this year you know, 33 cities, 15 countries, 64 speaking engagements. And then I told them who I'm doing it with. So I was able to say caveman. I was able to share a couple of the conferences. And then I signed it off by saying, let's jump on the phone and chat. So my first email isn't even really a pitch. It's, hey, let's jump on the phone and chat. I'll take notes. I'll figure out what we could be doing together. I sign it off and I click send because then the gatekeeper has the power to read the long email, summarize it however their boss wants to read it, Mm. and forward it to the decision maker. But if the decision maker wants all of the detailed information, Mm -hmm. all they have to do is read the message that the gatekeeper forwarded. That's so smart. That's so smart. So um, I know that you have um, more than a handful of clients that you work with. with some of those clients, do you kind of walk them through some of this and like coach them on pitching or do the pitching for them? So it's really interesting because I used to do marketing and PR. Okay. Um, but in October of last year, I stepped out of the PR space and exclusively started focusing on marketing. Um, but then because of this whole nomad adventure <laughs> pitching brands, I find myself back in no, the I PR think it's, I think it's great. Over. And I think that's a, I think that's an awesome, um, area of knowledge for you to sell in a course like that because i can see a lot i mean i think that sounds awesome i'm going to check it out um (laughs) now the other thing that i know just from following you is that you are like a master on instagram and i think a lot of people um 
are confused about like how to use Instagram, kind of frustrated with trying to see how that aligns with you know, bottom line sales and stuff as a business owner, but you and I have had some really interesting conversations about how you're using Instagram. And can you talk a little bit about like what your, um, what your like ultimate reasons are for using Instagram and kind of yeah. this areas, the features of it that you're really capitalizing on? So I'll be really honest with you, Joey. Instagram for me is not a place that I talk about my business really. And the reason for that is any of us who are the face of our brands, like my business name is Danny Fountain. Mm -hmm. um, we are multi-passionate humans. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that you want your audience to fall in love with you, not something that you offer. Because as you heard in the beginning, I've pivoted two, three, yep. four, five, six times. Yep. Um, and I want my audience to follow me through each pivot. I don't want them to drop off because I no longer offer marketing. Mm -hmm. So for me, my Instagram, while it started as a place to talk about my business, for any of you that follow me, I might mention my business once every two weeks. Um, these days, it's talking about nomad adventures and the brands that I'm working with and hanging out with Joey or Megan Nadell <laughs> or wherever I'm hanging out with an entrepreneur. And those are the stories that I'm telling on Instagram. But you're finding marketing nuggets inside of them. Like I... I'll post a photo of you. We've had this conversation. We've been hanging out all day. It's been really great. And I'll post some nugget that came out of what we were talking yeah. about. Uh, and then Insta story is the same. Anyone who follows me, it's insane. People follow my Instagram stories for my dating life, which <laughs> is a whole, <laughs> <Joey> does, <laughs> which is a whole other. Um, but I've really curated an experience on Instagram where you get to know me, the human, yeah. and you're learning the life lessons that I've learned the hard fought way so that you don't have to do the same thing. Yeah. I, I mean, I love following and I've learned so much. I, I think that, um, what I've like, kind of like what you said, what I really learned from following you is that Instagram is the place to show off the human side of you as a business owner. Yeah. And there might be some niches for businesses that have certain products where that can be like a direct funnel where you post things and people see the product and want to buy. Um, but I think that for most businesses and for service-based businesses, like you said, it's really a place just for them to know, like, and trust you as a, as the brand of the business. Even for businesses that produce a product at the end of the day, like take a photographer, for example, I'm going to be so much more interested in your content as a photographer. If you're sharing with me this photo of an engaged couple that you shot and you're telling me maybe the story of how they met or a funny thing that happened on the shoot, and then you're tagging whatever relevant vendors need to be tagged rather than just saying, oh, this is Tara and Michelle, they're engaged today, I shot their photos, blog coming soon. I'm going to be so much more engaged if you give me story. I love it. Well, and so so going back, and before I start um, my next point, I just want to say if any of you guys who are watching, I see that there's a couple of you that have seem to have been watching the whole time, which is awesome. Thanks. Um, if you have any questions about pitching or like how you should be using Instagram or things like that, feel free to let us know in the comments. Um, if you feel like you are struggling with how to use Instagram in a way that you're kind of happy with as a business owner, just put the number one in the comments just so we can kind of have a gauge of how big of a pain point that is for business owners. Because it definitely is for me. I'm still kind of learning as I'm going. But I think, Danny, when I talked with you and kind of understood more that Instagram wasn't a place for me to be in that sell mindset. Um, I was still kind of struggling with like, okay, like if I'm, if I'm just being a human, how does that help the business? Mm -hmm. And then we started talking about your numbers. And so can you talk a little bit about how, how it is actually turning a positive yeah. Return for you. So for anyone who's familiar with sales and marketing, the customer experience is a loop, right? There's the initial place where they find out about you. Then there's the place where they're evaluating you and evaluating you against others who offer similar things. Then there's the place where they finally connect with you. 
and they've kind of bought into what you do and they're around. And then whether or not they buy from you or they just click follow, from that point on, there's this loyalty loop Mm -hmm. where you want them to go through that circle over and over and over and over again. And you want to keep them there because every time you bring them back to that buy-in point, it's an opportunity for them, for you to sell to them without having to sell. So for me, Instagram serves that first purpose. Instagram is the point where people find out about me and that's where they're evaluating me. And I want people on Instagram to stay in that one or two spot. So that way, when they're ready for that buy-in point, they're clicking the link in my bio. They're navigating to my website. And my website is structured in a way that I can keep people there, which is Mm -hmm. another piece to this. If you're going to be driving people from Instagram to your website, you need a website that draws people through and that keeps people engaged. But so Instagram is the place where they fall in love with me. My website is the place where they buy from me. Mm. Instagram's only job is to get them to the website. Mm. And then the website does the work of the selling. Okay. Well, and since you mentioned Instagram taking you to the website, let's mm-hmm. talk a little bit about the link that you have. Um, oh, yeah. Is this still the link tree? So I did a blog post a little bit ago mm-hmm. uh, evaluating Linktree and pros and cons. And I've actually since made my own custom version of Linktree. Cool. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what that is real quick. So it's like yeah. a landing page, right? Yep. So for anyone who doesn't know, Linktree serves your audience up an unlimited number of options to click through once you click that link in bio. Um, so you can send them to your blog, your podcast, your shop, your contact page to a conference you're speaking at, to this live. And that can um, be really helpful because Instagram only gives you the one space to have Exactly, that. exactly. And so in the case of my website, or the case of the link that I have there, I know that there are three different people coming to my Instagram. Mm-hmm. There are people who only care about my dating life and they're following me for <laughs> the whiskey and the tattoos and the right. debauchery and what theoretically happens. There are the people coming who are interested in my marketing services. And then there are conference organizers or conference attendees coming to engage with me before, during, and after a conference. Mm. So my landing page is set up with three sections. It gives you ways to connect with me personally. It gives you ways to connect with my brand. And it gives you ways to connect with my speaking and pitching. Mm. I like that breakup. Um, Mm -hmm. So let, let me look into the comments real quick. I asked if people had... If people were kind of wrestling with how to use Instagram the right way, if they wanted to put a one in there, I see that Heather and Andrea both put one. Um, I, I mean, I'm there too. And then Heather asks, pitching, is it also for pitching boutiques to carry a product, you know, or who is getting pitched? So Danny, in your experience, if, if you're selling products and you want to like pitch to wholesale, is that a similar type of setup in terms of the way that you would reach out? So the same thing that happens with pitching where you want to share why you're brand loyal, why you want them there. The Mm -hmm. same is true for boutiques. So say you're a boutique that carries craft dish towels Mm -hmm. with little whatever on them. If you're pitching anthropology, you want to share, oh, anthropology, this is why I'm in love with your brand. I love your brand experience. This is what I do. I make these dish towels. This is why I think the dish towels would be a good fit for anthropology. Mm. So the same recipe can be used pitching product to wholesale as well. Okay. Um, Nick just said that my volume is either not on or low. Um, I think that I fixed it. Um, But if someone can uh, let me know, uh, Nick, can you hear me now better? Or is it no change? Um, He'll he'll get back to me. But let's uh, real quick. um, Danny, can you talk about how the those bottom line numbers because you talked about speaking and I think not enough yeah. business owners are thinking about you know regardless of what they're selling that part of what they what their goal should be to get lined up for conferences and speaking gigs so I'll be very transparent with you which is becoming a theme I um, love it <laughs> that 90 percent of speaking engagements in the creative industry are unpaid and not even just unpaid for you, the speaker, to show up, but your travel isn't paid either. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're getting a free ticket to the conference in exchange for speaking. Um, so when you're thinking about speaking as a visibility tool, you need to be strategic. You need to be investigating the conference's audience to make sure that it's aligned with your target audience. And so that way there's clear sales opportunities yeah. to the attendees when you're speaking. 
Um, but speaking can be a very effective tool because you're essentially giving them knowledge in a space that's neutral and non-threatening. And by the time your presentation is over, they should be convinced that you are an absolute expert and you haven't had to use the word buy from me once. Interesting. So I want to talk more about presenting before we get there. Part, like just to wrap this conversation up, you are part of part of this all is you getting your follower number high enough so that that can get your foot yeah. in the door. That ten to fifty thousand followers on Instagram is such a sweet spot. That's the micro influencer sweet spot. Okay. And if you do, if you want to do any kind of speaking, pitching, brand integrations, you really need to be at least at the bottom window of that threshold. And what is that threshold again? 10 to 50,000 on Instagram. Okay, I've got a lot of work to do. Um, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> no, so um, uh, where, where are we going with that? Um, shoot, I forgot our, our next train of thought there. Um, but oh, I, we were talking about the importance of target audience being uh, in the Oh, audience. yeah. So um, in terms of when you present, I mean, you talked about how you are reaching out to, you know, people who, who more align and can be your target market and then presenting in a way where at the end you don't have to say bye and they know that they want to work with you. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any like quick tips on things that you can do when you're speaking that can allow for that type of effect at the end? Yeah, three things. Um, first, never speak on a topic that isn't a service you would offer. Um, mm. So I'm a marketing person. It would be stupid of me to talk about law. Because how are those people going to enter my funnel? Yeah. So number one is only speak on topics that you want people to hire you for. Uh, number two is encourage the audience to connect with you in some way. So at the end of every single presentation I do, there's a homework slide that comes up. And I have some joke about I have a master's and a bachelor's and I'm sorry, homework's in my blood. Um, but I encourage them to shoot me an email by a target date mm -hmm. with their action items moving forward from the presentation. This does two things. One, it gets them on my email list. But two, they've emailed me. We've opened the door for a conversation because I can reply, give them feedback on the action items. They can ask a couple more questions. Yeah. Boom, our phone call, call is done all via email. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I love that idea. It's, it works so well. Then the third piece is after every speaking engagement I do, I send a testimonial request email. But I don't send the testimonial request email just to the conference organizer. As I'm giving my presentation, I keep an eye out for two or three attendees who seem really engaged in what I'm talking about. Mm. They're the people I send it to as well. And I say, uh, thank you so much for attending the conference. It seemed like you really engaged with my content. I would love... Uh, to have a testimonial from you from the speaking engagement. And again, opens the door. They end up replying with a testimonial, but also asking follow-up questions that were prompted. Oh, that's great. Console call in the email. I think that's fantastic. And one of the distinctions that I like that you added there is that it's, you're asking for a testimonial and not for a review. Yeah. And because I've learned this from, from Kate and, and some others that, um, using that type of language for feedback can be super helpful and important um, because it's, it's fine to send a review, especially if you're looking for that kind of objective feedback. But a lot of times you are wanting to kind of push them to say good things about you and not invite kind of negativity to end that relationship. And well, so and rather than giving them the option of saying, you know, what could we improve upon? you end on a really strong note and saying, I'd love a testimonial from you. So in my email, I ask five questions. Two of them are negative leaning. Okay. They are positive. So I ask uh, something to the effect of what was the actionable information that you learned? Uh, what are the next steps that you're going to take? What was engaging or enjoyable about my presentation? But then I also ask, what would you change? And mm. if you were to see me speak again, what would you ideally like to see done differently. So it's mm -hmm. kind of the same question. Twice. Yeah, but I like the way you worded that. Um, because I think that that's just, I mean, they're rooting for you and responding to that answer. And you base, so again, using this strategic two or three people that you're asking, um, 
you're essentially asking them to tell you in an email what they liked about you, which then you can turn around and leverage yeah. as a reason for them to talk with you further about working together because this is what you like. I think that's that's great. And so hopefully, I mean, if I've learned a lot of stuff from our relationship. Well, one of them is that I need to go out there and do more speaking stuff. Um, and I think that that's something that, you know, definitely applies to us in the service space. But I think no matter what, you can find a way to speak about what your creative passion is. Um, uh, I know that Brooke just has been, Brooke, thanks for letting me know that the audio got fixed. And she just hearted me on that comment. Brooke sells a really awesome uh, Soundwave product. Uh, Andrea sells awesome Mondo bands. And I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to speak to your craft and, and for you guys that are product makers in the audience, there aren't a lot of product makers on the speaking circuit. Mm -hmm. Like, this is your time. It's all of us service-based fo folks out there speaking at these conferences. We need some product folks in the mix. Oh, I love that. Um, so, Danny, this has been awesome. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of – there's one other topic that I, I want to say, um, which is about um, workflows. But before I bring that up – um, I want to thank you for like this conversation, which I know is going to take off. Um, knowing that my group and the members, I can tell that they're going to value this. Um, but also like for being one of those just like super willing creatives that I've met who like understands, oh, well, you're just, you're awesome. Um, <laughs> you're awesome too. We wouldn't be hanging out <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> So, so let's talk about workflows. Um, in the time that I have kind of communicated with you electronically, um, it's been awesome to see how on it you are when it comes to um, having kind of ready to go pitches and bios and headshots. Um, was that something that you built to, like over time or, or do you have, like what's on the back end? Is it like one spreadsheet with everything? So the reality of it is, Joey, I'm on the road this year, which means in every five day work week, I'm losing two days to travel. Like mm -hmm. I drove into Chicago this morning. That's time that I could have been working, but instead I was in the car. Yep. Um, so workflows for me are non-negotiable. Mm. And as far as the speaking and pitching specific goes, I have a page on my website that literally has my 100 word bio, has headshots, has who to credit, has all of that information. And then I have a canned response in my email so that when anyone asks for that information, it's thank you so much for asking for that information. Everything that you need is here. If you have any questions, here's my assistant's email. I just click the button, the canned response goes in the reply, send. I, uh, so canned response is essentially what I'm saying is so important. Like you've been a guest on the podcast yeah. and you know that the pre-podcast email and the post-podcast email are both canned responses. Mm -hmm. But all I do is swap out your name in the link. Yep. Uh, my pitch template is saved as a canned response. And then I go in and change the brand specific information, um, update the brands that I might now be working with, send that out. A lot of it is saved as canned responses in my Gmail. And and just because I didn't know this until a week ago when Dana and I were talking about it, these canned responses are super easy to set up through Gmail. Oh, yeah. It's the settings. Just you go in and enable canned responses in your settings. I think it's, it's awesome. Um, and then... Um, your every email that I've received, even the canned responses, when I could tell that there's just kind of been my name swapped, it still <laughs> it still comes off in a way that's like the fact that you put time into the actual response. Well, and that's, didn't that's take, the brand yeah. too, Joey. Right? Like my brand is very whiskey and tattoos, and you're gonna you're gonna get me. Like I'm sorry if that means that there's a few swear words yeah. in there, or whatever. No. Um, and I think that that makes for a more personal approach to email too, right? Yeah. Just because we're business owners, yep. we need to the school of hard knocks, like when it comes to invoices, when it comes to contracts, when it comes to all of those things, but any other communication, you're just as busy and stressed out and tired as I am. So you don't need to get a super formal email from me. Yeah. Well, so, so I didn't ask you for this, but I have a feeling you're going to allow it. So, um, Last week, when you basically told me that I should kind of do what we've been talking about, and I saw your speaker page, and I was like, this is awesome. Can I basically just take the format and write something? <laughs> um, 
if I'm going to put a link to your speaker page because I think it's super well done. And I encourage anybody who's listening who doesn't yet have a speaker page. Uh, I challenge well, you guys. In, in the ultimate pitching resource, there's a speaker page outline that walks you through the 14. Oh, awesome. Speaker page. Awesome. Okay. So, so I'll definitely send a link to that. Um, I'm definitely going to check this thing out because I know that that'll give me a lot of tools that I need to save time and kind of start this thing. Because um, in addition to kind of pitching in and of itself, something that I'm learning is finding sales from customer outreach over time can be a huge challenge. But if you can build referral relationships or just kind of collaborative partnerships to when people say they need something, you're top of mind. Um, yeah. Being kind of known as a speaker and a conference goer, like that all fits into helping with people coming to you. You, even if the person hasn't heard you speak, even if the person isn't a conference goer, even if they don't care about any of that, just the fact that you're willing to either attend or speak at a conference says that you're willing to invest in your business. Mm -hmm. I'm already five times more likely to work with you because I know that on the back end, you're doing the work. Awesome. So I will put a link there. Um, again, you guys should check it out. Um, I'll put it in like the, I'll edit this main post too. So that it's up there. And, uh, Danny, I think that's, that's all I've got for you. Anything that you wanted to sign off with or, um, anything other than that, uh, that new course that you've launched that you want to promote? No, that's everything, Joey. Super happy to be hanging out with you today. Your transparency has been awesome and appreciated. <laughs> and, Always. um, thanks for agreeing to do this, um, even if it, we're in the same room. <laughs> we literally are. You're five feet over there. <laughs> All right, Danny. Well, I'm going to wrap this up and then uh, walk over to you. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you guys later. Bye. All right. Bye, Joey.